Does the brain scale up like Photoshop, just like a linear expansion? Or is it the case that in larger brains, some regions become uh, notably large and others fail to get as big as they should, essentially? So what you're seeing here is a spinning human brain uh, with a map that answers that question. And where you see red, those regions um, expand uh, prominently as a function of brain size. In contrast, where you see blue, these regions expand but not as much as the red regions. Uh, they, they become uh, more expanded than the blue regions in larger brained individuals. This does not enable a large brain person to say, my brain is, is better than a small brain person. So, so our question is about bigger individuals compared to smaller individuals. But the two other routes to a big primate brain are evolving one, i.e. the difference between humans and some non-human primates, or growing one, the difference between an adult brain size and the size of a child. And this map that we found very strongly aligned with both of those maps. And what this was telling us is we seem to be detecting some sort of blueprint, an architectural blueprint, if you like, within the primate brain, given that all three routes to a big, bigger brain induce this sort of shift in brain organization. Um, and which was really very striking for us and suggested that it was a sort of deeply ingrained biological signature. So one metaphor is if you think about making a garden shed as big as the White House, you can't build it the same way. It has to be differently proportioned to be able to stand up. And it seems somehow that bigger primate brains need to construct themselves in a different way to sort of operate relative to smaller primate brains. What was prominent for these red regions is that they seem to bear functional and cellular signatures of integration. They're specialized in combining information from lower order systems within the brain. In contrast, these blue regions that don't expand as much tend to be involved in what are called sort of lower order sensory motor tasks, basic vision, sensation, motion. So genes that were involved in uh, the long processes of neurons that are important for connecting with other neurons are particularly highly expressed in these red regions. So these red regions have high levels of expression of genes that have to do with mitochondria, that have to do with energy uh, consumption and generation. So a hint that these regions might be potentially expensive or requiring more energy uh, than the blue regions. So at rest, we found that these red regions consume a lot more energy than the blue regions do. So altogether, um, this sort of seemed to suggest that there's a very basic architectural plan by which uh, having a larger primate brain consistently um, seems to require making some parts that are important for integration and hungry for energy disproportionately or, or um, more notably large in bigger brains the brain is spending its money differently, is if you know that brain shape changes as a function of brain size, it's going to help us more accurately detect smaller subregions of the brain that differ uh, as a function of age between males and females, potentially between patients and controls, patients and typically developing individuals who can all, all of these things are associated with brain size differences, which it's a signal of biological investment. These red regions have another signature in that they seem to be consistently impacted by a whole range of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, so they may actually be a kind of um, important key to understanding how a whole range of uh, genetic environmental changes can impact uh, higher mental functions, planning, uh, processing uh, difficult tasks, um, in, in humans. That larger brains are kind of constructed somewhat differently than smaller brains. And that different construction, uh, presumably, is there to perfectly suit each brain size. So evolution doesn't sort of spend its money uh, unwisely. Uh, so we're not suggesting that, that having uh, larger areas in these red regions and smaller areas in these blue regions are necessarily good, uh, it, but they are... Um, a clue about how the brain is having to optimize its configuration at different sizes and that gives us some insights into how the brain is um, operating. 
so we already know from prior work that within humans there's a subtle relationship between uh, general cognitive ability or IQ and brain size such that there, there's an association that larger brain individuals on average uh, tend to have a slightly higher IQ than smaller brain individuals. Um, to the extent that there are functional differences between large brains and small brains, and that's not something our study directly addresses, um, what our study shows is that there are also consistent organizational changes between large brains and small brains. And that knowledge, the observing that the brain needs to consistently uh, configure itself differently as a function of its size is an important clue into how the brain functions in health and is potentially a clue into how the brain has difficulties in disease states. W what is clear from our findings is that the red versus blue regions uh, seem to have a different biological cost from a number of perspectives. One, uh, it costs money to grow tissue. And the core of our finding is that the red regions grow more than the blue regions as a function of increasing total brain size. So there's money, biological money, being spent to build that extra tissue. The second signature of cost comes from direct measures of energy consumption at rest. And at rest, we know that these red regions seem to be a bit greedier and to soak up more, uh, to receive more oxygenated blood than the blue regions. Um, and uh, we interpret that as um, making the assumption that nature spends uh, its money very wisely, uh, that there must be a kind of functional reason for that differential investment. This is one of the most kind of comprehensive maps detailing how the brain spends its money. And it gives us leads regarding which brain regions we need to focus on and how we need to study them. And that's a real advantage because the brain's a big place and there are lots of questions you could ask. And having leads like this to help you know where to dig uh, is, a, is a very sort of powerful, uh, potentially powerful step. And for us, because we study patients that often have alterations in their total brain size, is by having these maps, we can do a better job of pinpointing which sub-regions of the brain seem to be disproportionately altered in those patients. Uh, and that is important because if we can understand the map of altered brain organization in patients, that might bring us one step forward ultimately in the future to potentially helping.